Okay, very good, very good. So good morning, everyone. We are in recording mode. Um, I do want to thank you to today's uh, session um, that goes until 1130. Pandemic Impact Practices, Pivots and Opportunities for Recovery Support. I am Kim Dent. I am the Executive Director with the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood, Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. And I welcome our esteemed panel. Um, before I do, um, we are missing one of our panelists. His name is uh, Mr. Willie Knighton. He has um, uh, taken ill. So I am gonna ask everyone for prayers for Mr. Knighton. Um, you know, again, he's unable to join us but I do want to open up the floor and allow our, um, our panelists to introduce themselves. And so John Sexton, I will start with you, please. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. And thank you, Kimberly. Uh, my name is John Sexton. I'm with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and I'm the Director of Correctional Recovery Services. We provide substance use disorder treatment to uh, the adult offenders who are incarcerated in the Department of Rehabilitation and Correctional uh, Corrections facilities across the state of Ohio. Very good. Thank you so much. And Harold Howard in Camarilla from Talbert House. Good morning. I'm Harold Howard, uh, Vice President here at Talbert House in Houston County, primarily Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm glad to be with you all this morning. Glad to see Director Dent. Um, look forward to a very robust conversation. Hey, good morning. Thank you. I'm Camarilla Tykemba. I'm the Addiction Services Director for Talbert House. We provide services, an array of services from outpatient to residential services. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, please ensure that you mute yourselves, especially if you're on your phone, please be sure to mute yourself so that we don't have the background noise because we really wanna delve into this very important topic. Um, I'm gonna honestly say in, in fatherhood, um, this has always been sort of a, a tough topic um, because of the stigmas and the, um, the myths um, and some of the, the misunderstandings um, that folks have, you know, in society about mental health and addiction. Um, and especially today, you know, with, with a lot of the different um, issues that society is facing. And so I'm just going to just read this real quickly because I really feel as though Reba really kind of hit this on the, the nail on the head with this. So one of the most reported consequences of the pandemic has been a significant uptick in overdose rates. The withdrawal of recovery services, for example, not meeting in person within recovery communities and the additional trauma and stress of the pandemic have been given as two drivers of the spike in relapses. And, and so I wanted to read that because I'm also, um, I also participate on Recovery Ohio Recovery Supports um, and more specifically the, the subcommittee peer community recovery supports. And that's some of the conversation that we've had since COVID. And so John, I'm going to pose the first question to you um, against um, state and national research shows that within our correctional institutions, a significant number of our incarcerated neighbors are in need of recovery support. If you know that a person who's returning as a restored citizen has need for recovery support, what help do you have lined up to support their counseling and medication needs through the recovery transition. However, before you talk about the transition into society, can you talk to us a little bit about what types of services are offered in the prisons? Yes, certainly. Um, within the uh, prisons across the state of Ohio, uh, we offer a uh, range of substance use disorder treatment services. These, trees, these services are voluntary uh, in nature for everyone who comes into uh, the incarcerated setting. And, and we start at the reception centers um, in Ohio by doing an assessment and a screening. Uh, we utilize a, an instrument called the Texas Christian University Drug Screen 5 instrument, uh, which gives us an understanding of a person's past history, 
um, their past use and the struggles that they have had uh, with that. Uh, after we've uh, scored that instrument and reviewed it, we assign what we call a recovery services level. And this level kind of helps drive our engagement with individuals to see what type of treatment is best needed for that individual. Um, and again, these, these services are voluntary, but as an individual transfers from a reception center to uh, an institution where they may say, serve out their, uh, the remainder of their sentence, we engage those individuals to uh, get them into a variety of treatment programs. Uh, we have what I would call our flagship program, our intensive outpatient program, uh, which where the majority of individuals go into this program uh, is a uh, it is a six month uh, program that has three different segments. Uh, it is all cognitive behavioral therapy based. And uh, if an individual goes through that entire uh, program, they're going to receive about 210 hours of uh, intensive outpatient services, uh, meaning they're engaged in group therapy, they're engaged in individual sessions, and then they're engaged in recovery supports, um, such as 12-step um, meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, things of those nature. And um, then we have, a, we have a, a segment of our population that comes in who serve uh, six months or less. Uh, because of the nature of their sentence. And with those individuals, we developed what we call a brief intervention program. It's cognitive behavioral therapy based uh, as well. And it, it covers a six week um, intensive program where we will uh, help those individuals uh, gain an understanding of how they can restructure their, their thoughts, their behavior, and engage in pro-social uh, behavior uh, without the use uh, or support of drugs or alcohol. And uh, then we also um, have had in the past uh, therapeutic communities within our, the correctional setting. Um, unfortunately, due, the, due to the pandemic in April, those therapeutic communities were halted um, because of difficulty with hiring and staffing of those settings. Yet, um, I'm happy to say we are in the process of reestablishing those uh, therapeutic communities as well. Um, we just began hiring for one site and we are going to be posting for another site next week. And um, a therapeutic community is a modality where the individuals live within a housing unit or a, um, a dormitory and everyone in that dormitory or unit is participating in the therapeutic community where they're engaged in uh, group counseling, individual counseling. They also have a hierarchy in which they take on responsibilities, which helps prepare them for transition back into the community. Um, with, with all of these programs and some other ones that we do, we help uh, engage that individual and help prepare them for their return uh, to the community. And so they can return as restored citizens, having tools and, te and, and techniques to deal with um, living a life uh, sober and living a life of recovery. And uh, as, as an individual goes through that process, we also have a couple of supports that the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services offers, uh, one being medication-assisted treatment, uh, for individuals with an opioid use disorder or an alcohol use disorder, they have the ability to get uh, two injections of Vivitrol, which is an injectable form of naltrexone. Uh, they can receive that prior to release. And then those individuals can also uh, have appointments, follow-up appointments in the community set up for when they are released. And so they know right where they're going uh, to engage in receiving continued medication assisted treatment. Uh, along with that, any individual who participates in our programming uh, and treatment is eligible for what uh, MHAS calls the Community Transition Program or CTP. That CTP program uh, allows and helps uh, individuals with recovery supports as they're going back into the community. Uh, we will pay for these types of supports up to 12 months for an individual. And that can include things like uh, continued treatment, uh, can assist with uh, housing, 
Uh, it can, can assist with um, transportation, education, and a whole host of other uh, techniques uh, that will help establish that individual uh, in their path to uh, restored living. Um, with that, uh, you know, we, as I said, the CTP will assist with counseling. Um, individuals who are released who have medication needs, whether those are health needs or uh, mental health um, medication issues, uh, they are released with up to a 30-day supply of those medications, and then they are also engaged on where they're going to go for their next appointments uh, back in the community. So... Hope, hopefully that helps answer your question, Kim. Absolutely. Thank you, John. And, and thank you for taking us through the journey of actually the, the incarcerated um, adult who is in, you know, addiction. Um, because I think it's important to know, um, you know, what happens while they're still there. And then also the, the transition back into society. So thank you so much for that. So um, Harold and Camaria, I actually have the next question um, for you. So whomever wants to, to answer this. Um, so broadly speaking, um, you know, as you look at what's happening in recovery efforts as we move through this pandemic, um, what are some of the trends that we are seeing in terms of availability of recovery services and accessing services? So more specifically, um, has the, the pandemic widened the gap for the recovery person and who's able to get into treatment? Um, yes, the pandemic has definitely widened the gap of services, um, but mostly because clients really don't believe that treatment is accessible and available to them. So uh, we initially at the onset of the pandemic when things was closed down in our area, people just assumed that substance abuse was not a priority. It was not an essential service, so they didn't even seek it. And those who were already engaged in it also was under the impression that that meant that their clinic or their facility was closed down and on an outpatient basis. So they, a lot of people went without either engaging in treatment or maintaining the level of treatment that they were uh, being provided before the pandemic. In addition to that, um, there was just a great deal of concerns about where were safe places to go? You know, even if they thought that the um, facility was open, how is it going to keep, going to keep it, how are we going to keep people safe? Uh, so there was that transition point that we had to go to telehealth, but clients were not equipped or even aware of the, the telehealth option. So we had to reach out to people and say, you know, we have this option for you. And that, and that yes, we're still open. Treatment centers for by far um, did not, completely closed down. Some, some may have, um, you know, changed the way that they were delivering services, uh, but social service agencies closed down, which gave the impression that everything was closed down and that treatment wasn't accessible. That was really a, a major factor. What you saw too, in that with that, that meant that people who was using they were isolating themselves, they was using alone, the then the in, therefore the increase of uh, the death overdose rose, uh, which was really, um, you know, very critical for us. Um, there was a lack of um, supply coming in, um, therefore people were oftentimes purchasing uh, drugs by, from people that they don't normally purchase drugs by, which also increased the overdose rate. Um, so the pandemic just stopped the way that people were functioning in general. Uh, once uh, folks began to hear, I mean, we had, had to be a whole lot of outreach and, and uh, engagement efforts made by providers. And so once they realized that the treatment facilities was open, um, they had alternative ways of providing services, then people began to engage again. But it was a, a drought almost in the folks that was receiving treatment earlier in the pandemic. Well, thank you so much. Um, that, and that, that is very disheartening, again, to, to hear, again, the, the, the you know, COVID-19 really kind of halted a lot of things um, when it comes to, to social services and, and just, I think, life in general. It just really put a pause on a lot of our lives. But 
one of the, the, the issues is this is um, a topic or, or a service that cannot afford to have a pause moment. Okay, um, and I do want to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question in the chat, I am going to do my best to mute folks if other people join us and then also monitor the chat. And so, Kim, I just yeah. wanted to add, think, yes, you know, again, this also highlights the importance of, um, you know, this whole front door approach, meaning, you know, whoever is providing, you know, community services really having their finger on the pulse about, you know, who's still actively engaging clients, um, you know, because we all play a role in making sure that, you know, individuals get to treatment or get whatever their needs are met. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it's unfortunate and a little bit of, you know, disheartening to hear Camaria talk about just people not truly understanding that these services continue to be open um, and continue to be available. Um, but just, you know, really continue to emphasize the point that, you know, collectively across all social service agencies, we all have the responsibility to really understand how to navigate through these times to make sure that, you know, wh whoever our clients are continue to know um, what, what's available in the community. So I just, you know, that was on my heart and I feel compelled to say that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you so much. So much for saying that's a very, very good point. Um, and so, um, John, Back to you, we talk about continuum of care, right? So um, what is being done within ODRC um, to um, provide continuum of care from the institution back into the community? So for example, I know you kind of gave us the journey of what's offered inside of the, the prisons and then you know how to engage in, um, you know, the restored citizen in this, this recovery. Um, in his or her recovery, but is there sort of a, what, what does it look like coming from the prison? Is there a break in services and then a gentle handoff? Or is there just a seamless transition from incarceration back into the community for someone who's in recovery? Yes. Um, it, you know, I, I spoke mainly about um, the recovery and substance use disorder treatment that we offer. Yet, uh, I just want to say that we, in, in the uh, partnership that we have between mental health and addiction services and the Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, we look at this process as um, one of we are always focused on the returning citizen. So, uh, reentry begins at reception. So when an individual comes in and they are looking at, we are looking at an individual who has just uh, been transferred to a state facility uh, from a county jail. We are looking at what are the needs of that individual? What are they coming in with in terms of medical needs, mental health needs, education needs, religious services needs, um, along with recovery uh, needs? We're looking at that person in a holistic manner. And that's one thing, I don't know if, if everybody heard yesterday when um, Mike Davis and uh, DRC's director, Annette Chamber Smith, talked about holistic services. Uh, that was one thing that when Director Chamber Smith came into DRC, she's very heavily focused on is making sure that DRC looks at an individual in a holistic manner and seeing what their needs are from, from beginning to uh, mm -hmm. the return and that whole process. And, and I think, uh, you know, we do a, a, a fantastic job. And, and I say we because I, I started with DRC many years ago, and then we transitioned our area from DRC to MHAS. And within that, uh, we have always maintained a very close and, uh, and happy partnership. Uh, between the two areas and, and our area of recovery services is actually embedded with DRC in their Office of Holistic Services. So we have frequent contact with medical personnel, mental health personnel, religious services personnel, and um, we've just done recently some collaboration with uh, the recreation directors and the, the uh, religious services staff, mainly the chaplains in each institution, where we are looking at how can 
when an individual is uh, engaged in a recreation area, how can we support that person's recovery and their journey back to the community, uh, as well as with uh, chaplains and uh, religious services and, and uh, engagement they do with activities. But uh, in, in looking at that whole process, we do provide a continuum of care from the institution into the community uh, with each of those areas um, by, uh, by connecting individuals who have medical needs with um, you know, caregivers on the outside, um, providing individuals with uh, connections to mental health providers on the outside. And, and much of that is done through uh, what we call community linkage workers. Um, mental health and addiction services has community linkage workers who work in each institution and they help assess what the individual's needs are with uh, concerns to mental health or emotional issues and with substance use issues. And so they're doing an assessment and then they're determining and working with reentry personnel on the DRC side of where do these individuals need to go, what services need to be available uh, to them. Um, now, and, uh, and I'm speaking specifically of those individuals who are just going right out into the community with no um, stipulation of parole or any type of parole sanction. Um, yet we do also work with those individuals who are on parole um, through uh, mental health and addiction services and their partnership with the parole and community services area. They have a connection of uh, what we call chemical dependency specialists. And these chemical dependency specialists work with parole officers and adult parole authority regions to connect individuals with treatment that they might need in that specific community. They're also a resource to the parole officers by uh, answering any questions that they may have, helping to guide the process of engaging that person with supports and recovery and treatment and those types of things. Um, so there is, there is a process and, and I, and I, in, I'd like to say that in all cases, it is a smooth transition. However, we do find some agency uh, difficulties where we have a hard time placing some individuals. There are some hard to place individuals, um, yet uh, I think we do uh, great with that as well because we work on the process of having a, a warm handoff. And much of that is made possible because of the medication expansion that has happened over the last few years. Individuals who are in the correctional setting get, a, get assessed and signed up for Medicaid, and they actually can leave with their Medicaid card in hand. Um, we, have, we have a process whereby an individual can leave with a, um, a Narcan kit in hand. If they believe that they or someone in their uh, circle of influence is susceptible to a possible overdose, we provide a Narcan kit that they can take with them when, when they leave an institution. Um, but that is, that is the main focus of also our medication assisted treatment program is we want to put in place uh, a process and safeguards where that individual can, can leave and have connection with treatment or continued medication assisted treatment um, in all those forms, so. Wonderful, thank you so much. That's a lot of, of great information. Um, I do want to, to pause a moment and, and say, you know, we talk about the cross department collaborations and partnerships to ensure that, you know, we are wrapping around, um, you know, our, our returning citizens and, um, I also sit on the ODRC Family Engagement um, Council, and we are taking a look at, you know, being very intentional about family engagement. And one of the, the tasks was, you know, let's, let's define really what are the elements of family engagement. And so I, I thank you, because I also sit on, again, the Recovery Ohio Recovery Supports um, you know, uh, committee. And one of the questions that we had was, you know, what does it look like inside of the prison um, when it comes to, you know, uh, mental health and addiction? And so thank you, John, for kind of being the person over at OMAS that was able to help kind of fill in that gap for the, the group that, that's working on family engagement at ODRC. 
The other thing I want to point out to everyone is, um, you know, in the seat that I sit in, I have the privilege of working outside of Ohio as well um, with some of the, the, the topics that we're talking about today. And I participated a couple of nights ago in a Cornell University webinar on, you know, criminal justice, and they're calling it criminal injustice. Um, and so was able to participate in a webinar for an hour. And then the next hour, um, we had questions from 50 Cornell University um, students kind of fired at us, which was great, because again, love that that learning setting. Um, but one of the things I will say just in in my work, is that folks look at Ohio as very progressive. And this is one of the reasons um, this particular um, event that uh, you know, Reba and, and the, the stakeholders are putting on for the last today and yesterday as well. Um, so I just want folks to know this does not happen in every state. And the, the family engagement that's going on in ODRC does not happen in every state. And the work that OMAS is doing, working with um, incarcerated adults when it comes to um, mental health and addiction, that does not happen in every state. So again, just kudos to, to both departments. And, and Kim, I just want to add this, that, that you are absolutely correct that this does not happen in many states at all. Um, we frequently work with other states and other state agencies across the nation where when they find out that, um, you know, there are recovery services or there are um, uh, engagement groups like Recovery Ohio, uh, and I, I'm thankful for Recovery Ohio. I, I happen to sit on the community, or I'm sorry, the Criminal Justice um, Recovery Ohio Committee and the Treatment Recovery Ohio Committee. And, and on those, um, we see a broad reach of engaging other agencies, um, from Department of Aging to Medicaid to Bureau of Workers' Compensation, and all these areas, and, and along with community agencies like Alvis House and, and Harold's Group, and, and just engaging individuals across the state to see that this affects every aspect of our community. And we are working as hard as we can to uh, bolster that system and make it as strong as possible. And, and other states do look at us to see how do we do this? Um, how, how can we have a process of prevention in the community where people don't end up in the criminal justice system? How can we move people from a criminal justice system uh, institution to the community in a seamless way and help them become a restored citizen and continue to be productive and live life uh, free of, of substance and, and actually then have impact on um, other people, their family members and other individuals. And I just came from the session prior to this on families and just to hear some of the stories and the engagement from uh, men and women uh, who have been impacted by their loved ones getting uh, clean and being able to live a life engaged where they've become better fathers, better mothers, better sons, daughters, and, and all of that. Uh, it's fantastic to see. So I just wanted to, to add that. Thank you. Thank you for that addition. Um, you know, and I, I was in that session as well. I think I saw, saw your name there and I was just so impressed with how open and authentic the speakers were about their, their, their individual experiences and situations. And so, you know, yes, um, we have to understand that the families are doing time, you know, with our incarcerated adults. So thank you for that. Okay, so Harold and Ms. Camaria. Um, so as recovery support providers in the community, where do you see returning citizens struggling the most with their own recovery? Well, uh, initially it's an issue about community trust. So they are then turned to a community that um, they really don't know what the stigma of being incarcerated does for them. They don't really want to be in a position of someone uh, ordering them around and telling them what to do. So uh, engaging them becomes a struggle. And because of the, the length of time that they may have been incarcerated, they also don't want to feel like they have to go into a program that's going to tie them down. So they don't really know a lot about individualized care once they go back into the community. Uh, so we had to work through some myths about what treatment looks like. They have no idea what treatment looks like. Um, and the fact that, you know, and they want to know what is the relationship between 
the criminal justice system and treatment. So they don't want to do anything that's going to put their freedom back in jeopardy. And so it's about educating and breaking down some barriers um, for the returning citizen. Uh, and of course, you know, um, they have the same disparities as the rest of the world, right, in requirements. So they get out of prison, they have to get a job, they got to get a job full time, they have to have housing, um, you know, they have to figure out how to have a relationship with their children, they have to pay child support. So they got all these other kind of barriers or all these other kind of pressures uh, lingering as well, and then they, the need for treatment. And so, you know, the first thing of getting treatment is to recognize that you really do need treatment. And so um, there might have been a period of abstinence or less use in prison. So they're not really recognizing the fact that they have the same need and, and oftentimes the same level of treatment need that they had before they went to prison. So it's just a, it's a cycle of uh, building the community confidence right uh, provider confidence with the returning citizen and um, letting them know that we're there for support and not corrections wow that's a, a great sentence you're there for support and not corrections and so yes i mean i i never thought about that so yeah thank you for that um yeah i think that that resonates with um you know a lot of folks on, on this on this call um, so Harold, do you have anything that you want to add? Um, how about working with fathers, specifically with dads? I know that Ms. Camaria, she mentioned child support, but sometimes fathers are trying to reconnect with their children. Yeah, it's, it's just the, the stressors of, you know, life when, uh, you know, fathers return. I think, you know, when we talk about it often is um, just really building those assets. And so, you know, we know what the, the research says about the likelihood of an individual returning versus not returning to prison. Um, and a lot of it is based off of the assets that they're able to build um, as they're um, released from incarceration. And so, you know, for us, what we typically see is, you know, it's very important for us to really work with, um, once we have a father in our, our program, our fatherhood program, um, we, we want to quickly also understand the family dynamic. Um, because that, that family dynamic is critical um, to what's going to happen for that individual. Um, over the next, you know, one to three years, because that's typically when, you know, the, the, the threshold for whether or not somebody's going to return to prison. And so, you know, we want to know who your co-parenting partner is. And oftentimes what we see is that um, the father does not have a current romantic relationship with his parenting partner. Um, and so when you think about that, um, there's a lot of different dynamics within that, that, um, that relationship. One is um, typically what we see is two wounded individuals. Um, we have a wounded father, we have a wounded parenting partner, um, and they're inflicting wounds on each other. Um, and then consequently, what's happening is there's wounds that the child is being, um, you know, obviously exposed to. So what we want to do is bring those two parties together and provide some co-parenting services so that she can get her needs met, he can get her needs met, they can better complement each other. Um, what happens there is you start to get an answer. Now I have a good relationship with not only my parenting partner, but I'm building a great relationship with my child. So now I don't want to return to the things that got me incarcerated in the first place. Um, the other thing too, just to, to piggyback on what uh, Camarilla was talking about, um, is really helping um, you know fathers meet all of their needs. Um, you know, typically for us, what we find is there's a lot of different barriers. And as Camarilla said, you know, they had an addiction issue going in, and they think because they spent a year or two years, um, you know, in the prison system that they're going to come out and that's all gone. And that's not the case. And so, oftentimes, you know, through these assessment processes, um, when we're, we're eliminating the barriers, again, the front door is so critical. You'll keep hearing me saying that if it's fatherhood, if it's housing, if it's, um, you know, trying to get some tenant of um, services, you know, whatever it may be, it's very critical that we assess the whole person. So we, we, we truly know what all the gaps are. Um, and it may be that they don't see the need for treatment. Um, but once we build that relationship and it's that trust that's been, that's there, you know, it's an easier conversation to say to, you know, Joe, hey, Joe, you know, we may need to, you know, consider getting you into treatment because the reality of it is when we talk about, you know, parenting time and things like that, you know, we need that person to be in a very good space 
um, so that they can be the best individual that they can be for not only themselves, but for their families and, and the life of their, their child or children. Wonderful. Thank you. You know, you're hitting everything that makes me smile, right? Um, and for those of you um, on the call, the Commission on Fatherhood, um, Talbert House is one of our fatherhood grantees, so we do fund them um, through, through TANF funding. And, um, you know, this, this topic really, I think with Harold and I mostly, um, has sort of lingered in um, at the Commission on Fatherhood for a little bit regarding some type of tool to assess dad when he comes into the fatherhood program. We do a lot of data collection on the father based on his parenting. We're doing a lot of data collection based on his, his um, what, he, what he sees as his outcomes as a, as a father, also as a co-parent. And then there's this other um, economic stability piece that, we're tr that we collect data on, um, which is job readiness, obtaining a job and then maintaining that job. But, you know, recently we, said we're going to really be more intentional about using some type of data collection tool or an assessment tool to ask dad about himself first before we ask him about his goals as a parent. So thank you for that, um, Harold, and thank you for uh, sending some of the tools that are being used in um, at Talbert House. And then we also, John, received some of the tools that um, Miss Joy Starr at OMAS sent and said, hey, we don't really stand behind any of these, but here's some stuff that you guys can start to look at. And so we have a team at the Commission on Fatherhood meeting every week to try and, and look at all of the, the tools that were submitted because we wanna make sure that the next biennial grant cycle, which starts next July, that we have a, a, a tool in place to really assess dad in that space. Um, you know, again, before we start to talk to him about um, his role as father. So thank you guys for that very much. Um, okay, so John, um, now that there is some return of normalcy a little bit, you know, we all kind of hit the ground running and getting home back in March, right? But we've now all, I'm not gonna say all, most systems have found ways to continue services, right? So now since we're getting back to some equilibrium um, in our, you know, healthcare and, and what we do at ODJFS, so forth and so on, um, where do you continue to see large gaps for men and women leaving the institution, even with some return to normalcy? Right. I, I, you know, I look at two different things, one very tangible and one intangible that, um, that I think Camaria and Howard have spoken to as well. Um, the, the one intangible is stigma. Um, there is, there's a lot of stigma um, still associated with an individual returning to the community as a restored citizen. And, you know, it, it, and that impacts people in finding uh, employment, uh, getting, getting their driver's license back. Um, finding housing and, and, and all of that uh, carries a weight uh, with them. Um, as, as Harold mentioned, when, when you have individuals coming back into a family setting, uh, whether there are children there or not, um, and more often than not, there are children there, but it, it carries a stigma. And we continue and have to continue to, to fight that, um, that just because a person has uh, served time in a correctional facility does not ruin them for the rest of their life. Um, I'm very happy and very, very proud to work with many individuals who have had um, a past of incarceration, um, have many of our uh, licensed clinician who work, cl clinicians who work in our field and in our setting who have had past uh, criminal records, and yet they have gotten treatment, they've gotten help, they've dealt with those issues, and then they've gotten out, they've gotten uh, their education, they've gotten licensure, and they've been able to make a, a, a gigantic impact in the field um, for recovery and substance use treatment. Um, but, I, but if, you know, we continue to fight that battle with stigma. Um, routinely. And I'm very happy, you know, that this event is going on uh, to help 
uh, you know, see or help people see that they, there are ways that we can combat this and that there are uh, employers out there who are willing to hire an individual, not based on what uh, their record was, but based on who they are and the skills that they bring to uh, their vocation. Um, but then the, you know, the real, the tangible one that I see as a gap uh, for us is, as I mentioned earlier, is housing. Uh, when an individual is leaving an institution, um, they have unfortunately um, many times burned bridges with family members, friends, and they are working maybe to restore that but that relationship may not be at a point where those individuals can go back to that home setting yet. Uh, there still needs to be work uh, done in repairing that relationship. And that's why I think marriage and relationship um, ministry is so important uh, with individuals who are restored citizens uh, because we want to get those relationships healthy because they have such a, um, an effect like a ripple in, a, in, in the water. Um, down through uh, the generations uh, of people. And so I think it's very, very important to continue to do that. And, and yet with housing, you know, individuals coming out, we don't always have appropriate placements uh, for individuals. So we, uh, we work on that. Um, but that is one uh, gap that I see out there. And uh, if those who are involved in this session can uh, work with people that they have influence with to create more housing, um, I, I would strongly encourage them to do that. Very good. I'm trying to make sure I'm muting folks as they're coming in. Okay, thank you so much for that, John. <laughs> um, and thank you for encouraging those on the call to, to work together because that's really how we, we address a lot of our social ills is with this type of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and so with Talbert House, so, so Harold and Camaria, um, what would you say are the, your current challenges for returning citizens finding services? Um, so, for example, I, I know you talked a little bit about how the pandemic affected restored citizens coming, you know, to to Talbert House. Um, but, and I know coming into Talbert House, you can almost come in there and not have to really be referred anywhere else. We talked about housing, um, you know, ensuring that you know there's health care, so that the the the, the Medicaid um, card is there. What would you say is the biggest challenge for Talbert House at this time? And maybe pre-COVID and if COVID changed that, that challenge. Well, I think we continue to try to position ourselves to be where the client is. So returning citizens, they are going to live wherever they're permitted to live in any community. So not every community has the same accessibility in terms of transportation. Not every community has the same accessibility in terms of fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. Not every community even have a welcome arm, right? And so it is our challenge at Tower House is to make sure that we are doing one, saving one life at a time by going to where the individual is, uh, making, making things accessible to them and giving them support. So we have a team of peer recovery coaches that will work and walk right alongside uh, our, our, our uh, clients who are addicted to substance or, or have experienced the use of substance and they're making a commitment to that person for a year. So uh, a returning citizen may not want to engage in treatment, may not want to even go to the fatherhood program, but they may agree to a buddy and that's what that peer recovery coach is. A person who says no matter where we're going, I'm going to go and walk beside you. So I'm going to help you figure out this housing thing. I'm going to help you figure out this education thing. I'm going to help you navigate. And oftentimes what happens is that then the other needs are actually met because we're looking at Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? And so we are responding to Maslow hierarchy of needs with our clients and Tower House has to just always be on point. We have to keep our ear to the ground and to hear what people are saying to us. You know, we can come up with a lot of great ideas that means nothing to the person who needs it, right? And so we got to hear from the people who need us the most where we should be and what the services are that is needed. 
Yeah, I, I love it, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, you know, it gave me it gave me goosebumps listening to you. Because, <laughs> and I'm serious. I mean, this passion, you got that passion for this work. Um, you know, and um, it's a privilege to work with um, the folks that we work with on a day to day basis. And, you know, trust is everything. And, you know, Kimberly talked about the peer supporters. Um, you know, everybody is not always ready when we want them to be ready. Um, um, and so, you know, if we can build the trust and we can build the camaraderie, it goes a long way in people letting us into their bubble. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I always say um, that I, you know, it, as crazy as it sounds, sometimes people ask for help with the hopes that we'll disappoint them. And that sounds very crazy. Um, but the reality of it is, is, you know, they want to go back to the person that referred them and said, see, I told you those systems don't work or that program don't work and, and, and now I'm free again. Well, you know, we, we have to use that very small window and opportunity um, that's given to us to, to, to just bust down the door, bust down the wall and have that huge impact that's going to help change that person's life. Because if we change a person's life, we're also changing the culture of people that's a part of that bubble with them. And so um, just, just hearing her say that was like, yes, it was refreshing on a Friday to hear that from you. So thank you, Cameria. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that was very refreshing. And you're absolutely correct. We know about passion, right? This is heart, the heart work that we do. And that's what we always say in fatherhood. We don't say this is hard work. Um, it's heart work. And, and you're absolutely correct, Harold. We have to meet folks where they are in their journey, right? And so in saying that, and, and John, I'm going to kick this one over to you, um, communities. Um, where do you see the best opportunities for communities? Because again, um, it takes all of us, right, to, to address um, a lot of our social ills, but where do you see communities um, coming together to generate greater availability to access um, recovery services? So let's talk about what communities can do, not just what, you know, Talbert House is doing or has done and not just like what our government systems are doing or have done. What can communities do? Absolutely. Um... And I, I, I come from a small town and I live in a small town um, again. And, and I think community all has to start with the first few letters of community. And to me, it, it transforms into the word communicate. Um, every, everyone needs to communicate and talk about what their needs are. And uh, just as Harold said, you know, you, you, you sometimes meet with a client and they want you to fail in providing what they need because it, it is seen as well. You know, you, you couldn't do it and I knew you couldn't do it. Um, and so, like you said, we're meeting their, their expectation, but you know, I think we can overcome that because in, in communities where people can communicate, um, we have the ability to, in, in that meeting together, find out, oh, I can provide this need, and someone else can say, oh, I can provide this need, and then we, we really have the, the ability to look at what is the, the whole person and the whole needs of that person, and able to, uh, you know, fill in the gaps you know, and, and in our treatment, we, we expect the person to do their part um, because, you know, we, we can't give, recovery is not something we can necessarily give. We give the tools and we give the guidance, but it's the person who has to do the work and, and day in and day out. And, and that is, uh, but we are always there to help guide that process. And I think in communities, um, they have the ability to do that. And that's what I love about uh, faith-based initiatives. There are so many people in communities that are engaged in faith-based activities where they can come together. Um, that can be a place where they can find out about um, a recovery house. Uh, I know in Springfield, Ohio, there are community houses that are run and funded by uh, churches and faith-based organizations. Um, I know in Hilliard, Ohio, there is uh, there are some faith-based organizations that put together um, basically grocery bags um, for individuals, you know, to help meet those uh, food needs, those housing needs. Uh, in London, Ohio, I'm familiar with a, a group where they uh, do 
um, they do groceries, uh, but along with that, they, they do uh, coats for adults and children. They do shoes for adults and children. They help with gas cards for transportation. There, these, are, these are things that our communities can do just by talking with one another. And uh, I, that's where I, I think that has the ability to generate greater access to systems. Um, and I know in faith-based organizations and churches I'm connected with, there are so many people there who are in recovery and who have the ability to say, hey, I can help you out. I can help take you to a meeting. I, and I, I actually know people in church organizations who are peer supporters and who will say, I can help get you connected with someone. And, and just like just like Howard and Cambria said, that, that's such a, a vital impact is having a peer and having someone that can talk with you and support you in that process. Um, so I, I see those are some great opportunities for communities to come together and, and have greater availability and, and access for recovery. Wonderful, thank you. Really good recommendations. Um, and so I'm gonna remind folks, um, if you have a question, um, you can either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself um, if you want to ask your question verbally. So I will continue to monitor the chat. And um, Talbert House, I, I wanna kind of kick that over to you all as well, because I think it's important that we really spend some time on what the community can do. How can the community help Talbert House in their efforts as well? And can you mention what counties that you um, are serving there in Talbert House? Okay. Um, so just a little, a quick overview of Talbert House. So Talbert House um, is a community-wide nonprofit. Um, we serve about 24,000 clients in fiscal year 20 face-to-face, -face, um, additional 70,000 uh, folks through our prevention services um, in, in FY20. So we currently have services in uh, Hamilton County, Butler County, Warren County, Clinton County, and Brown County. Um, and so, you know, that our we operate five service lines. Um, we have the addiction service line. Um, we have our community correction service line. We have a housing service line. Um, and we have our community care service line where programs like our fatherhood program, our 281 care crisis suicide and prevention hotline. Um, our services working with, um, you know, uh, early childhood education programs, um, just an array of different services in that service line. <clears throat> And then your question about how can communities help? You want to start with that? Well, um, so we have all these institutionalized buildings all over the community. <laughs> and so, and I'm always saying, open up the door to the church on other days other than Sundays and Wednesdays, right? And so what we, we need to be doing is we need to be utilizing the natural resources in our communities to welcoming people and to provide them services right next door to where they live or where they shop or that kind of thing. So, you know, we have currently faith-based leaders here in Hamilton County that is working with us at Tower to, to develop uh, faith-based coalitions. And those coalitions is looking at prevention and uh, recovery support programming. So um, we need to just continue to work in a collaborative way with our community partners. Um, to be accessible and available to people, to, to provide safe places for people to go to. Um, you know, a lot of people will go to a church or a recreation center um, a lot sooner than they will go to what they think is a treatment center or even to uh, jobs and family services. And so we need to be there and showing that we are a part of the community. Faith-based communities and, and, and natural, natural organizations in communities have to really be the neighborhood's community, right? It has to be owned by the neighborhood and controlled by the neighborhood and utilized by the neighborhood. So, you know, that, that you know, it's, it's, it's uh, developing the relationship that providers need to have with, with other people. And um, when, when, you have a, when you have safe places where you live, then you tend really to really watch the kind of behavior that you have. You tend to think about the outcome of any behavior that you have. You know 
you know that you can you, you can go tell a secret to somebody and the secret will be honored and that secret is maybe the gateway to you getting something else that you might need so we just got to be part become a part of the community and the community institutions got to become a part of the neighborhood very good I was yeah. counting on my fingers and I kept wondering why I came up with, I only mentioned four, so I forgot we also have mental health services as well. So. <laughs> well yeah, <laughs> well, that, that's a big part. Yes, thanks Harold. <laughs> and so, you know, um, I'm trying to, to, to think of a way to, to really ask this, but I just want to be authentic and transparent in, in my question. Because we talk about a lot of the, the community being involved um, but I think it's important for folks attending the call to know where the struggle is in the community. Where is the pushback? Where do you all think that, you know, um, if we just only got this maybe sector or these folks on board, what's not working in the collaboration to wrap around our restored citizens or even if they were not incarcerated? just our, our citizens that are in recovery or, or in addiction? I think it's about economics, actually. I think that uh, we live in a system of maintaining status quo. And so uh, people are afraid that if they give something or they're giving up something, if they open up their heart, they're somehow going to lose their soul. You know, so I think it's really about, you know, changing the perception um, of what giving looks like, what welcoming looks like, you know, and the fact that you don't have to necessarily lose to help somebody else in the process. I, I think it boils down to that. I think that we have a crisis um, about perception of other people, right? And so we have to really change the perception of um, who need, the people who think they are needy, or, you know, how we view people who are needy or they might need something. Um, they're not less than the man that has something. And so, and what you have is only temporal anyway, that can go away tomorrow too. So yeah, I think, I think it's about economics. Yeah. And I, I think for me, I mean, and, and it's always controversial to say it, um, you know, for me, it's that you really understand that, um, you know, we, we, our power, our power as agencies and individuals that, you know, really work with other individuals, I, you know, I know that um, oftentimes, you know, funding puts us up against each other, um, and I and I get that. Um, however, um, you know, we're in this business because you know we want to help people, um, and you know, we are doing um, ourselves. We're doing our own mission, our own life's work mission, um, a disservice if we don't make a referral because you know it's it's competition. Um, that's not what should always. Uh, rise to the top, which should rise to the top is helping people get their needs met. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not in this business to, to be a competitor. We're in this business to help people. And so sometimes I think within communities, um, with, within organizations, um, sometimes, you know, we, we limit the, um, the possibilities or the potential of the people that we work with because we simply won't make a referral. And we, that's just not acceptable. Um, and so I think that oftentimes get in the way and it, and it's unfortunate and, um, you know, it's on all of us to be change agents and, um, you know, not, not view this work that way. <clears throat> wow, great comments, Harold. I know we talked about that as well. Um, grant funding today, grant funding not today, right? And so it's here today and it could be gone tomorrow. Um, and so I, I absolutely love, you know, um, the statement of, you know, we have to remember that we're serving Folks. It's not self-serving, but we are serving other people in this mission. And it's not about the competition and the money and who got the grant and so forth and so on. Because I have seen where folks have disconnected um, and there were some, some hard feelings, um, you know, that one group received the grant and another group did not. But everybody needs to come together under that, that grant funding to ensure that we are walking towards the mission of ensuring that folks are receiving, you know, um, recovery assistance. Um, and so, John, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned um, some of the different resources in the various uh, counties. Is there a place that folks can go to, to know what's in their county? How, how would we know 
what's in uh, Springfield or what's in Hilliard. Right. And I, and I have to say, I, I know of those areas just because I'm connected with people uh, in those areas or, or have lived in those areas. Um, I think the best way to possibly, uh, you know, find out what some of those services are, are to uh, connect with um, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, to find out what um, services are there. Uh, and they, they have resources of mental health and uh, recovery um, connections. Uh, but I, you know, I would, I, I, I guess I would ask maybe, you know, people attending this may have a, a better idea of where there might be a one-stop shop to gain information like that. And, and, I, and I really think that needs to be a resource um, that people can quickly or easily access. So. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was thinking about, John, like maybe a, a dashboard or somewhere on the OMAS website. I'd like to enter in my community or my county and then mm -hmm. just have those types of resources pop up. I think that would be very helpful. Thank you for your comments. And, okay. and actually, Kim, I'm sorry. I, let me let me uh, jump to one thing. I will have to look it up, but there we we did establish um, back in uh, March, uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services established a care line uh, for COVID-19. That is also a uh, source of gaining information that's local to a community because how we set that up is when a person called that number, then they would be funneled to, once we found out what community they were in, they would be connected. There would be a warm handoff to um, an agency in that community that would have a listing of those resources. And uh, if you give me a moment, I will, I will look that up and, and bring it back to the group. Um, but I also want to just comment on your previous question uh, uh, that uh, Camaria mentioned, you know, economics um, and giving to people. I do think, I do believe that that is part of that, um, the whole of community is that we have to understand, pe many people are selfish, and that's not a popular thing to say, but many people are selfish and they don't want to give because they're tending to their own needs. And, uh, and they think, well, someone else will handle that. Um, but it really is about, you know, being connected to your neighbors and your neighborhood and walking across the street or walking next door and, and having a conversation and building that relationship and seeing what that person needs. You know, knowing that maybe you live across the street from a 78 year old widow and seeing what, you know, she may need or the elderly gentleman down the street um, or just the, the young couple next door and uh, seeing what their needs are and understanding that just because uh, you see needs out there doesn't mean that it's so overwhelming that you can't do anything about it, that you can give, whether it is helping somebody on the side of the street, helping your neighbor or giving to an organization, uh, even like, you know, just like uh, we were talking about the community agencies like Talbert House, you know, giving to those agencies, knowing that those dollars are going to be used to impact lives in a, in a dramatic way. So just wanted to say that. Absolutely. And, and thank you for that, because it really is a great segue into my, my final question for both of you. So what I will do is I'll ask the question to Talbert House while you're um, checking out that uh, the care line um, that was uh, put together under COVID. Um, and then maybe too, if you want to put it in the chat, if you do find it, John. Okay. And so um, Harold and Camaria, what can people of faith and of faith communities do to assist in creating greater opportunities for recovery support in distressed metro communities? Um, one of the things I, I will say that I really loved um, loved uh, Reba's idea, or you know, the 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 collaborations idea, to really um, focus on you know, our rural counties, our, our um, medium-sized counties, and like our metro counties, because although same need, how we approach it could, 
could look a little differently, right? And so what can the faith, people of faith in the faith community do in metro communities? So I think um, there was a time in history where um, churches in the metro communities actually went outside of the door, outside of the church, right? They went to the street corners, the amen corners. They went to, um, you know, the amen corners is where people gather and who have great conversation, right? They are like uh, the, uh, the brokers of the community, right? And so I think that we need to, well, faith-based uh, leaders need to include them in the processes that goes on on a regular basis inside their church. And so it needs to be a collaboration, a collaboration with every member in the community, every community council in the community. And they really need to know that people really are praying, but that's not the first conversation we need to have. Let us pray. That's not our first conversation. Our first conversation may be, let's see if you're hungry. Let's see what your immediate need is. And let's tend to your immediate need, right? And they need to also realize that there's a gap of people who even address uh, or have a connection with the faith community. That 18 to 35 year old is not really necessarily knocking the doors down to the church. So they need to figure out how to interact with 18 to 35 year olds. What are their specific needs, right? Or what are their specific interests and how you utilize their strengths to help the overall process, right? So I think this is, this is a route to engagement. They need to go, we all need to, right? Take personal responsibility and to be a part of the lives of people around us. Perfect. Perfect. Amen. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't know, Harold, if you have anything to, to say after that. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, that, that was like a thesis, like a <laughs> no, I have nothing. <laughs> Can we say drop yeah. the mic? We could say drop the mic, right? Um, absolutely, the church is is in us, right? Whatever your, your beliefs or whom, whichever you know um, faith that you affiliate yourself with, but you're absolutely correct. The brick and mortar, the four um, you know walls of the church, that's the church building. And so, yes, it, it especially in our metro communities, um, to come outside of your your church. Um, a lot of times, too. We have folks that attend churches in this city that don't actually live in that community. And so sometimes I think that can be the disconnect, that there are some things happening outside of your church doors um, in the community or in the city um, that, that you may not really be aware of because you're coming from somewhere else to come to that church in, in the inner city. So your, your comments are, are well received. Um, and so, John, I do see that you put the um, information in of the Ohio Care line, the number um, that was established. Um, and so also, I want to actually ask you that question as well. What, what do you believe that the, the faith community in churches can do in the metro communities? Well, I, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, what Camaria said. Um, and I think it is the, the people in the churches, especially in the metro area, um, being connected with that community, um, getting outside of the church building itself and being the hands and feet, uh, taking that care and that love to those around them, um, connecting with the, the, the businesses in those communities. And not just as a, a manner of saying, hey, can you donate? But going to that business and saying, what are your needs? What do you see the needs of the people who come into your business? Um, and, and as you mentioned, a lot of the people may go to that church and not be part of that community, but getting involved in, and being part of that community and uh, helping find out, building those relationships and finding out what the needs are of the people there and then working to um, establish a way to help meet those needs. And uh, I think that's, that's extremely important, uh, especially in our metro areas. We, we have um, so segmented areas of our cities that uh, people will have an idea, well, I don't want to go down to that area. Well, they, they need to go down to that area um, because there are people just like ourselves who have needs and we are to be that carrier of hope and help and the message 
of those things to those individuals there and see how we can help them and, and build a relationship not based on uh, an idea of I know better, but an idea of I'm, I'm one in this situation with you and how can I come alongside you and assist you with this. Wow, that's very powerful. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, necessary to remind folks that we are all one bad decision away from incarceration, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, one traumatic event that could send us into addiction um, and not to judge. And so I think that's, that's very important, um, John, that, that you do mention that. And so it looks like we have, oh, about four minutes left. And so I want to make sure that there are no questions. Again, please unmute yourself if you have a question for the panelists or throw it in the chat. So I am going to ask um, Harold and Camaria if you have one last thought. If you, if you had a 30 second elevator speech, right, on um, the importance of folks understanding um, you know, the struggles, right, of someone in addiction or, you know, um, incarcerated in addiction. So you can just choose what, whatever topic um, or even in recovery. What would be your message to someone who says, you know, hey, why do you do this work? What would be your response? Yeah, I, I, you know, for me, um, the response would simply be that it's impacting my family. Um, so I've seen, you know, the worst of it, and I've seen um, the work that, you know, people, you know, my brother struggled with addiction, and I've seen the work that he put in um, to come out of that. Um, I also seen how, while he was in addiction, what it did to our family, um, you know, because he burnt bridges, um, and we still had to love him. Um, we never stopped loving him. Um, and go ahead. And I would say the difference between me and somebody else is clearly their circumstances. So I am my brother's keeper. Wonderful. Thank you. That, that, that says it all as well. And, um, you know, and Harold, thank you for sharing that as, you know, about your family member, um, because we do, we go through the, the struggle with them. So thank you for that. Um, and I do see, I'm getting encrypted messages. I'm not sure. Um, why? <laughs> but it looks like Anne, to, Anne Reed and Stacy Griffiths, if, if you guys have something that you want to, to ask or to state, you may have to unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. The message is coming over as encrypted. So please feel free to unmute. Okay. Um, and if not, maybe send the message through Whova, the Whova app. Um, okay, so John, I'm going to shoot that over your way. 30 second elevator speech. Uh, same, same thing is, uh, same thing is that, you know, we, I, I've, I've been touched by addiction and I know other people in my family have been touched by it as well, impacted. And I, we, I do this because everyone around us is impacted, whether you know it or not, or not, whether it's direct or indirect. And so this is a, uh, an issue that we all need to step up and deal with. And we can, we can have an impact as we all join together uh, to, to fight addiction and poverty and economics of uh, what's going on in our world today. Perfect. Thank you. And I want to thank the panelists, uh, Mr. John Sexton with, uh, with OMAS, Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services, um, and Harold Howard and Camaria um, for joining us this morning. Um, I, we are coming up on 1130. And again, I am so sorry about the encrypted messages for the two folks that put a message in the chat. Um, again, if you still want to ask your question, we have about a minute left. If not, I want to thank all of you for attending. We are coming up on a 15 minute break before the next um, you know, event at 1145. So again, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, everyone did do a great job, and I just I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this.